Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us as we study these lessons. You probably recognize that they're prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a series of lessons for the months of August, I'm sorry, July, August, and September of 2018. And this is lesson number nine in that series for September 1 of 2018, entitled The Second Missionary Journey. Now, for those of you who are long-term Bible students, this should bring up some clear ideas. Uh, let's see what we can learn from it. Um, but as usual, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have gathered here this evening to talk about you and to think about you and to understand the best, as best we can uh, what you want us to learn from these experiences of Paul and Silas as they went on their way. May we uh, come to respect you more, become more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So now, our first missionary journey, journey was Paul and Barnabas. Why are we now talking about Paul and Silas? Read the text. Read the text. There you go. <laughs> That's always the right answer. Called controversy. Yes, controversy. So, but when they, Paul said, why don't we go back and see the, how our churches are doing? Um, and Barnabas said, yeah, we'll take John Mark. And Paul says, no, we won't. <laughs> and so what was the result? We ended up with two missionary teams. So God had maybe, maybe this was one time when God sort of got in the middle of a little argument here and got two teams out of it instead of one. Well, Paul and uh, Barnabas took John Mark and went to Cyprus, which of course was Barnabas's home territory. But Paul took Silas, and where did they go first? I was very excited to read. I read over it, read over this again and again because somehow or other, despite all my times through the Bible, I had missed the implications of Acts 15, 41. Let me read that to you. He went to Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Where's Syria? That's where, kind of where they started there in Antioch. Antioch was from Syria. They went through Syria. There's a huge country there and strengthening the churches. And where's Cilicia? To the north of that, just into Turkey what we would call Turkey. And that and was Paul's where, hometown. Yeah. That's where Tarsus is located. So here, there were churches. Now, were these churches started by Paul and now he's going back to strengthen churches that he himself had started? Not listed on the first journey. We do not know. And, and I don't, why did Paul avoid those areas? Did Paul uh, intentionally avoid those areas on the first missionary journey? Because he said, I've already been there. Maybe. Well, Barnabas was from Cyprus, and they were going together, so maybe, well, let's go to where you, you, you yeah, can but kind of... they didn't. Of, well, they, the first, on the first journey, though. They didn't on the first journey. That's they exactly didn't? the point. They, they skirted where Paul had worked. No, but they went to where Barnabas, Barnabas. was from. They went to yeah, Cyprus. Yeah, where, they went to where, where Barnabas, Barnabas was, from. was from, but they did yeah. not go where, Paul, where yeah. Paul had come from. But now he does, now that he's with Silas. Do we have any idea how long it was from the... Jerusalem and the decision was made till the time they take off on their second journey? Because not for sure, but it was not a long time. In my reading, Silas went back to Jerusalem with yeah. the others, but when Paul decided to get him, he had to send a message down to get him to come back and join him for his second missionary trip. And I guess I never mm -hmm. noticed that before. Yeah. Well, that reading actually... Carefully. Actually, it turns out that there's there's in the ancient documents there's two two different versions of that story. Oh, is there? One of them has Paul going, I mean Saul is going back to Jerusalem and the other one doesn't. So okay. verse 34 of of uh, chapter 15 says, but it seemed good to Silas to remain there and that's a parenthetical statement yeah. in the margin says early manuscripts do not contain this verse. Yeah. So, so there's yeah, there's there's differences. Okay footnote for that too yeah, yeah. in the Harper Collins study yeah. Bible or had they, those churches been started yeah. maybe by believers who'd been at the first Pentecost mm -hmm. we have no idea but at least Paul now has expanded his area of concentration 
to include Syria and Cilicia, and then back to the same territories where he had gone before. Well, what happened next? The next thing that's recorded is he arrives in Lystra. What do we know about Lystra? Place where he got stoned. That's the place where he got stoned previously. It was also the hometown of Timothy. Timothy. And believe it or not, I had the privilege of visiting Lystra. It absolutely nothing has been done there in terms of digging it up, finding out what's there. It's just a tell. Yeah. And you can walk across there and you can pick up things that, who knows, could be 2,000 years old. Nobody has touched the territory. I do not know why. Well, I, I can guess, and not to sound prejudiced in any way, but remember, Turkey is a Muslim country, mm -hmm. and Lystra has only, uh, is only of interest to Christians, basically. Yeah. And it would only be dug up, and maybe it will eventually be, be as a tourist attraction. My map says it's a, a, a ruin. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, a yeah. little logo for it's a, a room. It's a tell, I can tell you, having you walked were there. over in both directions. Well, and for those who don't know what a tell is, would you tell us? Yeah. A, a tell is a place where there was towns at some point or other. They, in most cases, those places have been destroyed, and then people have just piled, just sort of smoothed out the mess and built a city on top of it, and maybe that one's destroyed and it gets destroyed. And so it's a it's a mound. It's a, heap. it's a heap. It's a mound, usually fa fairly flat on the top. These are not large things, and you could have to climb up all, mm -hmm. on, all the way around. You have to climb up to get there. So that's a tell. So it's basically the ruins of the city. Yeah. Well, what did Paul do for Tim with Timothy? He circumcised him. Whoa, hold on. <laughs> I thought this wasn't necessary. <laughs> yeah. Why is he circumcising Timothy when he just came from a conference in Jerusalem saying, we don't need to do that? Well, we didn't need to do it. The Gentiles didn't need to do it mm -hmm. for salvation. Okay. But uh, the reason here would have been that Timothy was coming along and to get into a synagogue, he would have needed. You know, that was usually Timothy the first entry Timothy point that they had. His mother was a Jew, and if his mother was a Jew, you He's, were a Jew. Yeah. His father was a Gentile. Why is that? Why did the Jewish Isn't people just face their line? Inheritance. Well, there's a reason for it. The well, Jews have you, thought this You know who the mother is. Yeah. Yeah. You can be sure always, who the mother is. You can't always be oh, sure who the father, who the father is. is. Good, <laughs> good point. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> okay. Jackie, you're going to tell us about what hap what, some words about what happened in situations like this. Um, do other people's scruples, do they, should they impact us? This is 1 Corinthians 10, 27 to 11, 1. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you decide to go, eat what is set before you without asking any questions because of your conscience. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Notice it says, not asking any questions about whether it's healthy or whether it might be, you might be allergic to it. It's any questions because of your conscience. Okay. But if someone says to you, this food was offered to idols, then do not eat that food for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. That is not your own conscience, but the other person's conscience. Well then, someone asks, why should my freedom to act be limited by another person's conscience? If I thank God for my food, why should anyone criticize me about food for which I give thanks? Well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for God's glory. Live in such a way as to cause no trouble either to Jews or to Gentiles or to the church of God. You do just as just do as I do. I try to please everyone in all that I do, not thinking of my own good, but of the good of all, so that they might be saved. Imitate me then, just as I imitate Christ. Wow, it's beautiful. Can yeah. you imagine someone today standing up in church and say, "Imitate me, 
as I imitate Christ. <laughs> How many of us imitate Christ? Who do you think you are? We would, think yeah. we would say, American. if you're imitating Christ, you wouldn't say something like that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, in effect, but let, let's be honest now. In effect, Paulo is saying, I risk my life every day to bring the gospel to these people. <coughs> Why would I do anything from self-centered motives or to turn them away from Christianity or Christ? Isn't that a fair question? Are we willing to set aside some of our personal desires or even convictions in order not to offend someone else? Of course, this does not include compromising to biblical principles or standards. Paul had some things to say about that as well. And I'm going to read those verses in Galatians 1, 8 and 9. Did he have standards? He said to the, he wrote to the Galatians, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preached to you, may he be condemned to hell. <laughs> we have said it before and now I say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. Sounds like a fanatic. And I might add that <laughs> that message was written to the churches in the area where Timothy came from. Wow. Does sound like maybe a bigot, right? Well, he had standards. It's going to apply to what we face in the f near future. Yeah. He knew what he believed. We don't know exactly why Paul was attracted so much to Timothy, but Timothy ended up being the kind of son that Paul apparently never had himself. And Timothy was respected by all the local believers. I think that's an important point. Um, we've already mentioned the fact that in the Jewish tradition, inheritance is passed through the mother's line. So Timothy was technically a Jew. And what, is it, what does it say about him? He was trained from his childhood by whom? His mother and grandmother. And, and grandmother. grandmother. Mother and grandmother. Eunice and Lois, right? Yep. Yeah. Because one, uh, okay, Timothy was probably not circumcised at birth because his father thought it was, thought it was not necessary, maybe even barbaric. Paul realized, realizing that Timothy would be working with him among Jews, realized that in order to prevent any unnecessary conflicts later, Timothy must be circumcised. Wow. So again, this is a Jew being circumcised, yeah. not a Gentile being circumcised. Because he was circumcised. considered a Jew by the other Jews. Yes. And if he had not been circumcised, that would be a problem. Well, if you were a Jew, would you be willing to be circumcised just to make it possible for you to spread gospel to the Jews, many of whom would reject what you had to say anyway? I often wonder what they did it with. Yeah. <laughs> well, I always wonder why the other people knew whether they were or weren't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> were they participating in the Roman baths? Yeah. Circumcision was so important to some Jews that to worship with someone who was not circumcised could spoil their whole day. So how would you like to be on a committee to determine whether someone was circumcised <laughs> or not? Jim, you're nominated. <laughs> Well, there's a, a passage Drop about out that. Of the church. <laughs> yeah, there's a passage about that. The other Jim, I think we got you got that for us. Galatians two one to five. <clears throat> Fourteen years later, I went back to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went because God revealed to me that I should go. In a private meeting with the leaders, I explained the gospel message that I preached to the Gentiles. Now let's stop for just a second. Is this the general conference held in Acts 15? Probably. Mm -hmm. 14 years later, he says, he's talking to the Gentiles. So that previous meeting was 14 years earlier. It might be very early in his experience somewhere. Okay, go ahead. I did not want my work in the past or in the present to be a failure. My companion Titus, even though he is Greek, was not forced to be circumcised, although some wanted it done. Prebent, pretending to be fellow believers, these men slipped into our group as spies in order to find out about the freedom we have through our union with Jesus Christ. This could be with Christ Jesus. They wanted to make us slaves, 
But in order to keep the truth of the gospel safe for you, we did not give in to them for a minute. American Bible Society, they 1992. Made, they, had a, they chose a committee to find out whether or not Titus was circumcised. <laughs> yeah. A circumcision committee. Any of you ladies want to join? <laughs> oh, <laughs> How man. long after Timothy was circumcised? Are we talking about a long time? No, because they I mean, started it, out on the second it, missionary. This, this has to be this has to be back somewhere right near the beginning of Paul's work that we know about. When he says fourteen years later, fourteen later years later after what? Isn't he well, talking about the first? He's, he's talking. He's ta no, he, he, no, he's talking about he's talking about fourteen years after he became a Christian, the the the, the, Damas the Damascus Road experience. Hmm. That's not what I read. So, okay. Well, let's we'll, we'll go and look at it. We'll ask everybody to do that when you got a moment. Well, after having circumcised Timothy, they visited churches that Paul had started in that area. But when they tried to travel south and west into the area of Asia Minor, including Ephesus, so we're talking about moving toward Ephesus, the Holy Spirit prevented them from doing so. How did he do that? Yes, was this a donkey in the path preventing them from, like Balaam's experience? Or was it a storm? Or or they, why? they tried to go north into Bithynia, but in some undisclosed way, the Spirit prevented them from going there as well. So they traveled westward to the seaport of Troas. I think a little. Uh, I think Paul was warned by the Holy Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem the second time. But he went anyway. Yes. So was he free? Unfortunately. So was this a similar thing? Was, did Paul get a warning? Don't go to Ephesus. I want you to go somewhere else. Is that what he means by prevented? Well, I'm, I'm, I asked you that question. Apparently I'm so. I'm asking you back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any reason? I don't think either one of you have the answer. <clears throat> well, look at, the, look at the specific verse there, Acts 16, verse 6. They traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit did not let them preach the message in the province of Asia. How do you understand that? God's timing. Yep. Uh, well, you know that later Paul spent three years in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. In the next verse, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's well, Paul and Silas, Silas were prophets, Jesus. so each of those could have been, uh, well, we see Paul in a minute getting a vision. But okay. Silas could have equally yeah. been a uh, source of uh, inf inspiration. And they just well, didn't write it down. Well, what we know is they went to Troas, and two very important things happened in Troas. Let's see how good our scholars are here. What are the two important things that happened to Troas? Luke must have joined them there. Luke joined them there, and... We had the vision. You already vision. talked about that. Vision. Paul received the vision, come over into Macedonia, Macedonia and help us. Mm. Now this is leaving Asia, going to and going Europe. to Europe. Yeah. That's a pretty big change. See now Paul is blinded by light. He spends however long in the desert, you know, and now he has a vision. I'm, I, there wasn't one way to communicate. From God, you mean? Yes. Have you had any of those methods? I haven't. I take one, anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, my method is the scriptures. I think the reason we don't have so many uh, of these visual things today is because we have the scriptures. I think there's another reason and I will be honest about this, I think if God made a regular practice of sending us messages, and someone, you know, suppose someone came to church and said, Wednesday night I got a vision from the Lord, and this is what he told me. Pastors do that, or have been doing that all the time. I'm not excusing it, but that's, that's not unfortunate. What do we do usually when we hear that? And how would you know if it was God or whether it was Satan that had given you that vision. You test it against the Word. Yeah. 
and see if it's so, true. But why did Paul have to have different methods? I mean, obviously, <laughs> Damascus Road threw him on the ground, yeah. but it's just curious. I know we have lots. I'm glad people are asking questions that we don't have the answers to. There are more things to learn. Well, there were tongues of fire, too, that fell yeah. on everyone. Yeah. And thousands of people heard them speaking the word in their language. Right. So, and healings and raising from the dead. So it was wild. Okay, we're going to go to Acts 16, starting with verse 11, and hear what happened. We left by ship from Troas and sailed straight across to Samothrace and the next day to Neapolis. From there we went inland to Philippi, a city of the first district of Macedonia, and there's more than one way that that can be translated. It is also a Roman colony. What do we mean by a Roman colony? Retired soldiers maintaining the... The, the Romans, just like the Greeks before them, felt that their goal was to convert everybody ultimately to be a Roman. Either, if not a, completely a Roman citizen, at least committed to the Roman government. So they wanted a Roman city here, a Roman city there, a Roman city here. And so what they would do is they would pick a city that they thought was in a key spot, and they would send a group of retired Roman soldiers, and they would establish themselves there and take control of that city, and they would rule it as if it were, and they were treated as if it were still a part of Rome, even though it's off somewhere. So here's a piece of Rome out here, and there's a piece of Rome over there, and there's a piece of Rome over here. And uh, this was one of those places. And where Paul was born must have been also one of those possibly, places. Possibly. We don't have that said for sure, but possibly. We kind of do it these days with ambassadors. Yeah. Well, we spent several days there, Paul says. On the Sabbath, we went out of the city to the riverside, where we thought there would be a place where Jews gathered for prayer. Now, we know from records that the Jewish tradition and, and custom was if there are at least 10 Jewish families in, some, in a place, they're expected to establish a synagogue. So we will conclude that there were not 10 families, maybe no Jews at all, but at least not 10 families here in Philippi. And I can tell you that if you have the privilege of visiting Philippi and you have a Christian guide, they will take you outside the city to the this, this side of a very beautiful little bubbling stream, and there they have put up two very beautiful places to worship, um, a place where you can be baptized and so forth. We sat down and talked to the women who gathered there. One of those who heard us was Lydia from Thyatira, who was a dealer in purple cloth. Purple comes from Thyatira. She was a woman who worshipped God, and the Lord opened her mind to pay attention to what Paul was saying. After she and the people of her house had been baptized, she invited us, us, notice, come and stay in my house if you have decided that I am a true believer in the Lord, and she persuaded us to go. So how many were them traveling together? At least Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. So here's a woman, whether or not she was married, we do not know invited four men, maybe all single, to come and stay at her house. Paul wasn't single, but he was maybe separated. Yeah, at this point in time. Well, how would you go about finding out whether or not there was a synagogue in a city? Was it and how so, big it was. Was it so obvious that everybody, you know, the non-Jews would know about the synagogue? Probably. Probably, yeah. Be surprised. What do we know about Paul's habits? There's a, one, there's a number of verses that talk about his have Sabbath habits. Acts 13, 14, 44, 40, 42, and 44, 17, 1 and 2, and 18, 4. I'm going to read 17, 1 and 2 because this is pretty clear. Paul and Silas traveled on through Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue. According to his usual habit, Paul went to the synagogue. There, during three Sabbaths, he had discussions with the people. So we, we, we can know that Paul made a regular habit of attending Jewish synagogues on the Sabbath. Okay? And it says he went there on three Sabbaths. So that means he didn't go to the synagogues on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. He went to the synagogues on Sabbath. 
Was that just because he was trying to reach Jews? No, but it was his this is habit. Yes. Time habit. Uh, do you have that word in um, Greek, usual habit? What oh, would I would say? have to hold on just a second to see what it says. Mind. Custom. Custom. It's custom. Um, See, da, 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 da. Well, you're verse looking. eleven is it? What what verse was that? Well, you're um, looking. Well, one and two. I guess. Seventeen two. Seventeen two. Well, you're looking it up. Let me read verse three there. And explaining the scriptures, it wasn't just that he went yeah. there. He explained the scriptures, and proving from them that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from death. So, he went there not just to socialize, but to evangelize. Uh, there was a synagogue and according to Paul's custom, yeah, according to Paul's custom, he went to, went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them. So there's, there's a good... Custom, I mean... Yeah, it says clearly, to be used to, to be accustomed, it says. That's what the word means. Mm. Okay? Thank you. So, there they were out by the riverbank and they got themselves invited home for a nice Sabbath lunch probably, right? Paul and his associates worshipped with them. That is proof of the fact that Paul kept the Sabbath even when there was no synagogue available. Well, what happened next? Acts 16, 25 to 34, about midnight. Paul, I guess I should back up and talk about after three, three weeks, what happened? There were some jealous Jews Mm -hmm. And they caused an uproar, and he, Paul and Silas were thrown into jail. Okay. So, and this was the city of Thessalonica, right? Slave girl was also, she had a demon oh, cast out of her, too. Yeah, I was wondering, this is, we're still in oh, yeah. Philippi, I think. Philippi. Philippi. Yeah, that's oh, a Philippi. slave girl, yes. We're, we're still in Philippi. So, as they're, as they're here and, and so forth, here's this, wo this woman who apparently, we don't know exactly how this works, but she was somehow demon-possessed and, and, and prophesied to people about their futures and so forth, and people paid a lot of money to have that done. And so when the demon was cast out of her, these guys lost their source of income. And they stirred up a, mo a, a mob and attacked Paul and Silas and took them to this, uh, I don't know exactly what the sequence was there, but anyway, they ended up being imprisoned after being beaten severely. And the, the indications are that they were probably almost in a position of being crucified against a rock and where they were, they were, they were <clears throat> manacled to hands and foot. So here you are, about 45 degrees. How would you sleep? They didn't have to worry about sleeping. They were singing. Yeah, exactly. What else can you do, right? Well, we know what happened. There was an earthquake, and those manacles fell off, and the jailer came rushing in, realized that all the doors were open. He says, I'm about ready to kill himself because he knew what would happen if he allowed any of the prisoners to escape. And Paul said, what? Stop. Don't, don't stop. We're all here. And then what happened? He went and baptized the whole family. I want you to imagine yourself a part of the jailer's family. You are awakened in the middle of the night, and your husband or father shows up with two beaten up ex-prisoners, clean up their wounds and said, these guys have something important to say to you about their God. And you would say, huh? <laughs> but, they, but they were all probably wide awake from the earthquake. That's also very possible. Yeah. Probably don't out in the streets. <clears throat> don't you kind of wonder about the other prisoners? Did their manacles fall off? Yeah. Were they free to leave when the doors went open? What did they think about the yeah. amazing experience? Yeah. Well, Paul said something in that, ex in that exchange found in Acts 16, verse 31, which has challenged and puzzled Christians from that day to this. They answered, when the, ja when the jailer said, what must I do to be mm. saved? Some people say it probably should say, what must I do to be safe? 
but saved is better for our understanding now. They answered, believe, and the word is, have faith in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your family. Wow. Is it possible to be saved just because you have faith? In verse 30, the jailer asked, sir, what, what must we do to be saved? Was he expecting, do I have to sacrifice an animal? Do I have to whip myself? Do I have to cut myself? What do I have to do to be saved? Probably I don't think he expected the answer, just believe. Yeah, no, probably not. Probably not. Okay, Myra, I think you got some words about faith. Yes, from Graham Maxwell. Can you trust the Bible? Faith is just a word that we use to denote a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. Faith implies an attitude towards God of love, trust, and deep admiration. It means having enough confidence in him based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe whatever he says as soon as we are sure that he is the one saying it. That's in not brackets. brackets. Uh, to accept whatever he offers as soon as we are sure that he is the one offering it and to do whatever he wishes as soon as we know that he is the one wishing it without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith, faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means that like Abraham, Job, and Moses, God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. Wow. Is that a fair definition of faith? Mm -hmm. And it's a lot more than just, well, I think I believe that. By the way, you know a lot of pastors have made a big deal out of the difference between faith and belief. What's, what's the difference between faith and belief? The same root. It's a spelling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the spelling, that's right. It's exactly the same word in Greek. Also trust, I think. If you go to James 2.19 where it talks about the devils, do you believe that there is only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. And the word believe there is have faith. Exactly the same word. And we can believe without fear. Yes. So the difference is when the devils, the devils know the truth, but it doesn't change them. They won't allow it. They're in, they're in rebe ongoing rebellion. So what impact does this faith have on your life? That's the question. Well, do you think it's possible that the jailer already knew something about Paul's messages? I think he might have heard him maybe in town. Well, I mean, did, did that family have enough preparation? Did Paul give them the 20 lessons from Voice of Prophecy? Well, Ellen White says there is need of there is need of a more thorough preparation on the part of candidates for baptism. I wonder what she would have said about the jailer. The principles of the Christian life should be made plain to those who have newly come to the truth. Testimonies of the Church, Volume 6, 91 to 92. Well, in the Ethiopian, Ethiopian uh, treasure, yeah. where that Philip baptized also. Yeah. Well, Look at verses 35 to verse 40 in chapter 16 there. The next morning, the Roman authorities sent police officers with the orders, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the officials have sent an order for you and Silas to be released. You may leave then and go in peace. But Paul said to the police officers, we were not found guilty of any crime, yet they whipped us in public and we are Roman citizens. Mm -hmm. Now think of the implications of that in a Roman city. Then they threw us in prison, and now they want us to send us. They want to send us away secretly. Not likely. The Roman officials themselves must come here and let us out. Was Paul just trying to show off his muscle? 
The police officers reported these words to the Roman officials, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were afraid. So they went and apologized to them. Then they led them out of prison and asked them to leave the city. Paul and Silas left the prison, went to Lydia's house. There they met with the believers, spoke words of encouragement to them, and left. Why was that necessary? They would have probably been accosted. Yes. On their way out of town. Yes. Had they not had the security of the Roman guards. Okay, that's well, a good point. Well, these <laughs> Paul and, and Silas had been beaten up by the crowd and taken to jail as criminals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they come back again, you know, the, the people are going to say, these are those criminals. Mm -hmm. No, Paul and Silas need the people to know we're not criminals. We are, we, we are Roman citizens. We are loyal people. Yes. We aren't outlaws. Yes. So that means that the church that they had started would have a better standing. If someone came and said, what are you doing here? Well, we're, we're worshiping the way we were taught by those two Roman citizens who came here, remember? So I think really the, the purpose for that was for them to say, we might be an illegal religion, but we're not nobodies. It also perhaps gave the jailer a chance to talk about his newfound faith. Yes. Do we have any extra biblical sources or traditions in early Christianity among the early church fathers of what happened to the jailer? Did no. he stay faithful? Nothing that we know. Not as far as I know. If you go look it up. I, uh, I will tell you that if you, if you visit Google. Philippi, they will show you the prison which they will also say, this is not the one. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Philippi on the map? Well, it's, it's a little ways in, inland from the coast. I see Ephesus. Here. I'm trying to... No, no, no it's, you're over, you need to go over in Greece. We're not... Thessalonica? Not, All right, so go... It, it's a little bit, it'll, it will be... The to the east. South and east of Thessalonica. Uh, south and east is water. Yeah, more, more north and east. Uh, oh, I see it. Yeah. Right there. yeah. Okay. That's actually yeah. real close to yeah, this one. Yeah, not far. Well, think about this now, about the Jews and stirring up trouble and so forth. How would you feel if a new preacher showed up at town, completely new guy preaching things you never heard of before, and half of your church left and joined him? <laughs> it's about money. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, fortunately, the next place they went to was Berea. And what a difference in the response. I have several questions. I've, as long as I've known about the story, I've had questions about it. Where did those Bereans find scriptures that they could use to compare with Paul's preaching? Were there multiple synagogues in Berea? Were there Jewish people there that had, I mean, remember that they have a copy of even one book of the Bible that had to be written out longhand on very expensive paper or even vellum. Yeah. Not just everybody could have a copy of the Bible or even a small part of it. Paul said he had, uh, you know, bring the books yeah. in one of the end of one of his letters. So yeah. he must have, or collectively with others, had yeah. uh, a collection. Books. So how, how do we respond when someone comes along with a new idea and presents it at Sabbath school or church? Do we go home after the pastor stands up and preaches and get out our Bibles if we haven't looked at them carefully enough already to find out for sure whether or not the pastor, what the pastor has taught is correct? Should we? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or should we just assume that uh, because the pastor is a pastor and he's employed by the denomination, whatever he or she says must be true? No. Depends Examine how all they do it. Mm -hmm. Examine all things, hold fast yeah. to that which is good. Well, unfortunately, the, the Jews from Thessalonica found out that they had gone to Berea and went over there and caused all sorts of problems there. And so to prevent real chaos, 
they, they hurried Paul out of town. Some people went with him, got on a boat, and traveled down to Athens, which was a fair journey. And what happened in Athens? Well, Paul started looking around. And what did he find? An uh, idol many to the temples. unknown god. Wow, an idol to an unknown god? Mm -hmm. Wow. How would that happen? I mean, I could see maybe worshiping some kinds of gods, but to an unknown god? Why would anybody do that? Well, there's a possible explanation, and Gordon, I think you have that. From the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 351, Diogenes Laertius, an early third century writer, tells how Epimenides of Crete was invited to help Athens in the time of great pestilence. The Cretan took some black and some white sheep to Areopagus and turned them loose to wander through the city. Wherever one of the sheep lay down, a sacrifice was offered and an altar was erected on the spot. The memorials of this atonement bore no name. So even so, though this guy was writing in the third century, he's writing about something that happened way back. Yeah. Something that happened that was present before, before Paul, Paul was there, yeah, and that's yeah. the explanation. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, imagine you, you okay, where are we going to build a church? Well, follow that sheep. <laughs> <laughs> follow that black him. sheep or that white sheep yeah, or both. Yeah, maybe we'd be especially inclined to follow the black sheep, right? Yeah. <laughs> But the Greeks had a lot of different gods. Yes, a lot of different gods. There's a lot yeah. of different gods. Exactly, exactly. And, so and having uh, another one, they just wanted to cover all the bases in yeah, a way. Right. So what do we know about the Areopagus, that big, long, funny name? Mars Hill. Otherwise sometimes called Mars Hill, yes. Mm -hmm. If you have the privilege of visiting Athens someday, you will see the Parthenon up there, that beautiful, huge temple uh, on top of the hill. But if you go down a little ways and do a little bit of a dip, you'll find a very rocky outcropping, which was Mars Hill, called the Areopagus. And you will find there the original Greek from the Book of Acts carved into a plaque on the side of that rock right there. So you can read the speech in, in Greek, if you'd like, as you mm. climb up the hill. Well, it would have been very interesting to hear Paul's speech. We have only a snippet of it, I'm sure. But he got rather un an unusual response when he talked about God being the judge of the world and people rising from the dead. And why was that? This was completely contrary to the beliefs of most of his Athenian audience. They believed that God, one, was utterly a transcendent, having no dealings whatsoever with the world or concerning human affairs. What do we call that today? Aesthetic. No, there's another term for it. the idea that God maybe got started, thing got things started, but he um, disappeared. Deism. 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 That was one of the founding principles of many of our people who found our nation. In fact, it was what it was the belief of William Miller in his early years. And two, that when a person dies, there could be no resurrection at all. Wow. Yet there were some very important people who accepted Paul's message. Dionysius and Damaris, who apparently accepted Paul's teachings. How much difference should we allow in the ways people use to spread the gospel in our day? So what, what, what have we seen here? What we see here is that what Paul said to these totally non-Jewish, non-Christian people, non-Jewish and non-Christian backgrounds, was a different sort of a message than he would preach to someone in a synagogue. Why, why was there this difference? You have to meet people where they are. Yeah, yeah. understanding. And he said, you know, this God that I worship, that you need to know, is the one that keeps you alive. Okay. And he's someday going to judge you as well. And they're saying, what? That's contrary to everything we've believed. Well, Paul thought it was necessary to move to Corinth very quickly. There he met Aquila and Priscilla, who ended up being lifelong friends. They not only shared his Christianity, but also had the same trade, so they ended up working together, making tents. 
And why were Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth? Remember the story? Okay. Well, let's, let's read Acts 18, 4 to 17. He held discussions in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to convince both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived in Mas from Macedonia, Paul gave his whole time to preaching the message, testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they opposed him and said evil things about him, he protested by shaking the dust from his clothes and saying to them, if you are lost, you yourselves must take the blame for it. I am not responsible. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he left them and went to live in the house of a, a Gentile named Titius Justus, who worshiped God. His house was next to the synagogue. I always smile when I read that. I'm sure <laughs> that the Jews are really excited about the fact that Paul moved right next door. <laughs> well, Crispus, who was the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with all his family and many other people in Corinth, heard the message, believed, and were baptized. Well, what did Paul think about the situation in Corinth? Galio? No, we're not quite ready for that. What did Paul think about the situation in Corinth? Give me just a moment. He thought things were so the, the things were so wicked in Corinth that there wouldn't be a reason for him to stay there very long. And what did God tell him? What? I still have a lot of people in this town. Stick around. And how long did he stay there? A year, a year and a half. A year and a half. So uh, we have a way of dating that period very precisely. How do we date it? By who the governor was. There were new leaders that were sent to Corinth, because Corinth was one of the special Roman outposts. There were new leaders sent there every two years. And one of them was named Gallio. What do we know about Gallio? Charles, I think you've got something on that. His full name was originally, uh, originally was Marcus Aeneas Novatus, but upon being adopted by a wealthy Roman named Lucius Junius Gallio, he was thereafter known as Julius Aeneas Gallio. He was the brother of Stoic philosopher Seneca, the tutor of Nero. Wow. wow. Seneca dedicated to his brother the proconsul to treatises, the anger and the blessed life. Gallio was probably proconsul of Achaia, sometimes between A.D. 51 and 53. After he retired from Achaia in consequence of an attack of fever, he returned to Rome. At first he enjoyed the favor of Nero, but eventually fell under the tyrant's displeasure and, according to one tradition, was executed by him. Another tradition represents him as an anticipating his fate by suicide. Tacitus, however, speaks of him only as dismayed by the death of his brother Seneca and pleading with Nero for his life. This is from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 363. Okay. So when Silas, Timothy, and Luke joined Paul in Corinth, they brought monetary contributions from the churches in Macedonia, 2 Corinthians 11, 8, and 9. This allowed Paul to spend full time at his own expense spreading the gospel. And elsewhere, Paul says what? He says, I worked, I worked at night making tents so that I could preach during the day. Hmm. How many of us would be willing to do that? Soon Paul was forced to move out of the synagogue, as we've already mentioned, but he moved right next year. After a year and a half in Corinth, while on his way back to his home church in Antioch in Syria, Paul took Aquila and Priscilla with him. In a stop at Ephesus, they had an opportunity to meet with some Christians there who begged him to stay. Instead of personally staying, he left Aquila and Priscilla there to build up the church, and he promised that he himself would return. By the way, where did where did, were the Philip Basilla when we first heard about them? Corinth. Didn't they come from Rome? Aleppo. They came from Rome and probably left. Mm. They may have been even Christians that earlier uh, and the, were left, left Rome at the point when, 
when the emperor at that point in time established a, 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 a thing against Jews. So they left there and came to Corinth. Then Paul worked with them for a year and a half. He says, come with me. And then he moved, they moved to Ephesus. And later, at the end of Romans, we find out he greets them back in Rome. So these are moving people. What they tent makers too, I think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul later went back and spent three years in Ephesus. And we have some thoughts about that. Sally? Those who today teach unpopular truths need not be discouraged if at times they meet with no more favorable reception, even from those who claim to be Christians. Then did Paul and his uh, fellow workers from the people among whom they labored. The messengers of the cross must arm themselves with watchfulness and prayer and move forward with faith and courage, working always in the name of Jesus. Hmm. Acts of the Apostles, page 230, paragraph 2. And then, Jim? If in the closing scenes of this earth's history, those to whom testing truths are proclaimed would follow the example of the Bereans, searching the scriptures daily and comparing with God's word the messages brought them. There would today be a large number loyal to the precepts of God's law where now there are comparatively few. And I would just add there, I am having the privilege of working with a young lady at the clinic, one of our MAs, who's going home and she's listening to these, looking, reading these things and listening to lectures, Adventist material, and then she goes and she reads the Bible and she says, wow, this is amazing. It's really exciting to see someone do that. Margaret, I think you have something to add as well. Okay. All will be judged according to the light that has been given. The Lord sends forth his ambassadors with a message of salvation, and those who hear he will hold responsible for the way in which they treat the words of his servants. Those who are sincerely seeking for truth will make a careful investigation in the light of God's word, of the doctrines presented to them. That's from, uh, again, from Ellen White. Acts of the Apostles. Okay, so what was the response? Talking about, jumping back and talking about the response in Athens. When they heard Paul speak about a raising from death, some of them made fun of him, but others said, we want to hear you speak about this again. And so Paul left the meeting. Some men, were, some men joined him and believed, among whom was Dionysus, a member of the council. And those, there was also a woman named Damaris and some other people. So apparently some very influential people actually potentially became Christians there in Athens. And there's some comments about <coughs> that that I think Carrie has for us. As listed, there are three distinctly different responses. The first one is some mocked. They were amused by the passionate earnestness of this strange Jew. It is possible to make a jest of life, but those who do so will find that what began as comedy must end in tragedy. I thought that's good. Mm. Yeah. The second response, some put off their decision. The most dangerous of all days is when a man discovers how easy it is to talk about tomorrow. The third response was, some believed. The wise man knows that only the fool will reject God's offer. That's from William Barclay's Acts of the Apostles. Well, it's interesting to note in Paul's speech there, as he's talking to these sophisticated people in Athens, he quotes a pagan prophet. A, I'm sorry, not a pagan prophet, a pagan writer. Is that a good idea? A pagan writer sometimes says what's right. Mm -hmm. could say something's right, and, and Paul quotes him as an authority, I might add. Well, it's clear that what Paul and his companions were guided, they were clearly guided in missionary activity by various visions and directions from God. Should we hesitate to move out into missionary activities without that kind of guidance? Mm -hmm. What do we have that Paul didn't have? We have the whole... Have All the of the scriptures, Bible. even in a computer like this, where you can look up all kinds of stuff. We also have the writings of Ellen White. Do we need more than that? How do you think you personally would have responded to what you have learned? In, you, 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 how do you respond to what you learned in this lesson? What factors keep you from sharing your faith right now? 
Is there any reason why you could not get together with another church member or friend and begin sharing the gospel? Remember that those who share the gospel are co-workers with God. Wouldn't you like to be one of those? There are several important lessons we need to learn from Paul's second missionary journey. He continued to visit churches even in places where he had previously been stoned and left for dead. He also was willing to adapt his message to diverse audiences. How would you feel about being a companion of Paul as he experienced things like exorcisms, quiet witnessing at Riverside, beatings, conversions, rejections, public evangelism, jail time, chaotic mob attacks? I mean, what's going to happen tomorrow, friends? Sometimes we almost unconsciously seem to think that if God is on our side, we will not face any of these challenging situations. So why did God think God allowed Paul to suffer in being beaten, etc., etc.? In his early, early in his experience in Corinth, Paul was tempted to think that very pagan and very corrupt city was not worth his efforts. And I'm going to drop down. Paul continued to work there for one and a half years. But what can one expect in a with God experience or life? Does such partnership convey special protection, divine leading, or inner peace? Perhaps all three, but note Paul's summary of what his with God ministry included. Five whippings, each including 40 lashes minus one. Put another way, 200 lashes minus five, totaling 195 lashes. Three beatings with rods, one stoning, three shipwrecks, including a night and day adrift at sea, multiple dangers, sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, cold, and nakedness. That's 2 Corinthians 11. You can read about it there. It's also quoted in our Adult Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Anybody want to join Paul? Mm. Wow. Well, Jesus is the, is the attraction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to I join Jesus. Jesus. They persecuted him, they'll persecute us. Don't so. count on him being treated any better. They crucified oh. him. Yeah. <gasps> Suffering is a complex issue which requires a lot of careful thought. Are you prepared to suffer for God's sake? Have you had any, any experience like that in the past where you have been mistreated because of your Christian beliefs? Would you stand up and speak the truth even if the devil faced you face to face? our kind and loving Father. We can read about these experiences of long ago and different times and different situations and we might think those are, those are remote things. They, they couldn't happen now at our time in our society. But we are forced to believe as we read through Scripture that times like that will come again and they could happen in our lifetime. Help us to spread the gospel as vigorously and forthrightly as we can so that that time, in fact, may come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.